church family, are you happy to be here today? Yeah. Me too. We begin a brand new series today. It's called He's a Keeper. Before we get into that, though, I would also like to say today is United Sunday, so cheer for one another, welcome one another. We all come together today, and even those out there joining us online, so happy that you're here and a part of this. Also, today is Communion Sunday, so if you did not receive one of these when you came in through the doors, please right now raise your hand and somebody will come your way and give you a communion cup. Keep your hand up until they do find you, please. So, so, so good to see you guys. Man, I missed you. I missed you. So happy to be. Uh, Kim and I have been away for a, a period of time getting some R&R. You guys know the series last few weeks was rest and relaxation or recovery, and we were doing a lot of that. Do me a favor and let all the pastors who spoke over the past few weeks, let them know an incre what an incredible job they did as they led us in that worship time. But today I'm extremely excited because we begin a brand new series. Like I said, it's called He's a Keeper. Throughout this series, I'm going to be talking to primarily to the men in this room. But at the same time, I want to challenge the women in this room to encourage the men in your life, to challenge the men in your life, to pray for the men in your life, because they, we as men, need to find out from God's Word what it is that He has called us to do and to be. So. All those ladies here who agree to do that, would you cheer right now for the men in this place? And let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Father, today we ask that your truth would be revealed to us, that your word would stir up in the hearts of men, courage, strength, a heart for you, that you would call us out to be the men that you want us to be. Father, we pray that you would bind the enemy, that you would reveal the work of the enemy, that it would be exposed and we'll be able to see clearly what's been happening, what's been going on in our world and our culture around us. Father, we ask that you, by your spirit, would speak today and you would have your way with us. Yes, Lord, we ask that you would call us out to be the men that you want us to be. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come out, come out, wherever you are, said God. Well, your translation might read it like this. Adam, man, where are you hiding? He said that when uh, he was walking through the garden one day, and he knew what had happened. He knew everything that had occurred and how the snake had come and, and talked to Adam's wife, Eve. How, how the snake said, you know what, you eat of this tree, of this fruit, uh, you're not going to die like God said you're going to die. Uh, God's just trying to keep something from you. God really doesn't want the best for you. And so that's why he told you not to, not to eat of this tree. And, and so he tricked Eve into taking the fruit and, and eating the fruit, and then, then she passed it to her husband, Adam, and he too also took it and ate it, and instantly they realized they were naked. And so what do we do? Well, they found some leaves. They tried to cover themselves up because of the shame, and, and then they go and they hide. And it's while they're hiding there in the garden that, that here comes God. Here comes God, and he says, Adam, Man, and notice the one he addresses. He didn't say, woman, where are you? He said, man, where are you? Why are you hiding? Come out, come out wherever you are. And finally Adam came out and he, 
He said, well, we, 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 we hid. We had to cover ourselves up. We, we, we had to camouflage, camouflage ourselves a little bit. We, we wanted to kind of disappear because we, we, we know we messed up. And by the way, it was because of the woman that you gave me, God. <laughs> it was her fault. Yeah, you know the story. You know the story. You know how the God walked through the garden calling man and saying, where, where you at, man? Where are you at? And I believe today we still have God walking around going, man, where you at? Where have you gone? Why are you, why are you hidden? Why do why, why you try to camouflage yourself and, and just blend in with everything else around you? Where are you at, man? And not only do we have God saying, where are you at, man? We have women saying, where are all the men at? Where are all the real men at? We have young ladies going, man, I'd love to, I'd love to get married someday, but I'm, I, I can't find a real man. We have women saying, man, I'd love to have kids someday, but I can't find a real man to father my kids. Where are you at, man? You know, we have, we have grandparents even saying, where is that man at who gave me those grandkids who has since disappeared? Now I got to raise my grandkids because where, where is he at? Where are you at, man? And on and on and on, we find that men are coming up missing. Maybe physically around, but, but truly missing. And, and what they're missing is they're missing the divine calling that they've been given. So many wander aimlessly, not knowing why they're even here in the first place. Not knowing what God has divinely called them to do and to be. Where are you at, man? My, my prayer as we look to God's word is that we discover it. We find it. Or God finds men who will assume that role and that responsibility once again. Who will rise to the the calling that he has given to them. And oh, it is a high, high, high calling. It's something desperately needed in this world in which we're living today. What is it? We go back again to the garden in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we find what we were created to be. Let's look. Then the Lord God took the man. He created man out of the dust. He breathed into man the breath of life. And then he takes the man. He doesn't, he doesn't just say, hey, do whatever you want to do. He says, I've got a, a job for you. Then the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and, what's that next word? Keep it. Keep it. Circle the word keep. And men, that's it. You're created to be a keeper. A keeper. A keeper in the garden. A keeper in this world. A keeper in your world. A keeper in your family. A keeper in your workplace. A keeper in your neighborhood. A keeper in the lives of your, of lives of your children. A keeper. What is a keeper? What is a keeper? Well, we, we might say uh, a zookeeper. What does a zookeeper do? Yeah, it takes care of animals. You guys are on it today. Yeah. Uh, or how about a bookkeeper? What does a bookkeeper do? It takes care of the books. Or how about this? If you, um, if you were to go tour a castle, let's say over in Europe, a medieval castle in Europe, uh, something I didn't know until I actually went and toured a castle a long time ago in Europe, and I was surprised by what I found. You see, 
I always, I always saw these castles, and you had the big walls right around the castle on the outside with the uh, things that go like that. So maybe archers can stand up there, and they can guard and defend against anything outside those walls. And, and so when I always thought of castle, I thought about the castle walls. And that is part of the castle, but it's not all of the castle. Uh, you see, you have the outside walls of a castle, but if you were to tour a castle, you might go into the castle, and in the center, in the very center, is a tower in the, in, in the center of that, those castle walls. And that tower is actually called the castle keep. And the castle keep, the, the purpose for the castle keep was for anybody, if, if the walls were ever breached, if the enemy was able, ever able to come in and, and, and knock down the walls or come through the walls or crawl over the walls or, or breach the, the castle walls, everybody who was inside those walls before would simply run to the castle keep. And they would come into the castle keep, and it was, it was even more fortified. It was a tower, and, and you could block it off. And, and, and the hope was that, that if they breached these walls, at least you'd go and, and, and stay in the castle keep and be kept safe there. It was called the keep. Do you know in Scripture, um, in the Psalms, it says, it says, talking about Jesus, that he, the name of the Lord, is a strong tower, right? And the righteous run to it, and they are safe. The name of the Lord is a castle keep. The name of the Lord is a strong tower that, that whenever the enemy comes and attacks, you can run to this and find yourself safe. Uh, that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. In the same way, in the same way, a man, a man is to be a keeper of the garden. A man is to be a keep. A man is to be a safe place. A man is to be someone that others can run to and find safety and security there. A keep, a keep. That's part of what it means to be a keeper of the garden that we've been called to be. So here we are talking about a keeper, but now I know it sounds kind of weird as I'm talking to men. I want to kind of shift a little bit and talk to the women here in the room, okay? Because here a man is called a keeper, but you know, in the, in the same passage of Scripture here in Genesis, it says that God formed woman, right? Right? He said it was not good that man should be alone. Remember that? And so he says, I will make for him a, anybody know? Helper, right? A helper suitable for him. And so often people, women have heard that helper. I, helper? He gets to be a keeper and I'm just a helper? I don't like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm so much more than just a helper. And maybe, maybe get a little angry at that, maybe a little upset at that, maybe saying, how, how dare they call me just a helper? I was made for more. And if that's you, then I want to say you're not understanding what it really says here in God's word. You know, the actual word for helper here is the word easer, E-Z-E-R. Okay, so men, keeper, women, easer, easer. And some of you are going, that doesn't sound much better than helper, right? <laughs> no, no, no. You know, what, you know what easer? If you go to the book of Psalms, do you know even God himself is called the easer? The easer? And what it means is a help meet, somebody to come alongside the man. Somebody who compliment, they, we compliment one, we're called to rule together. Together. The scripture says the two will become one flesh, Right? And it's the keeper and the easer, the one. It's, it's not a lesser role by any measure. But it's, it's, a, it's coming. You know why God said, I will make a helper suitable for him? God knows us men need help. We need help. Oh, do we ever need some help? Last night, last night, my wife, is, uh, she, made, she made homemade vegetable soup last night. How cool. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of her sous chef in the kitchen, you know. 
And the, what that means is she does the put, putting together of all, oh, it's incredible, so good. And, and she's so much better a cook than I am. She puts all this stuff together, and I'm the sous chef, which means I kind of clean everything up around her, right? And so I'm doing my job as sous chef, and which is, is as soon as she uh, puts stuff in this pan and, and, and empties this pan and has this pan over here and stirs with this, I'm collecting everything, and I'm going, I'm putting it in the dishwasher. And I'm doing my job, and I'm thinking I'm doing really good doing my job. Next thing I know, I go out, and I come back in the kitchen, and everything I've already put in the dishwasher, she's rearranging again in the dishwasher. <laughs> and she explains to me that, that I'm not really good at that, you know? And listen, listen, I'll admit, I'll admit, I'm not good at that. I need help. I need help in a lot of different areas. But in needing help doesn't, I, I, I don't feel bad as a man because of that. In the same way, in the same way. Listen to this, listen to this. For 31 years now, a little over that than that, I've been opening my wife's door to the car and letting her in and closing the door behind her. Okay? Some of you are going, big deal. Some of you are going, that's so antiquated. My wife has never felt less because I'm doing that for her. In fact, that helps her feel more as a woman. And she delights in that. She delights in that. And, and, and in the same way, when, when you bring two very different people together, how many of you would agree that, that women are different than men? No? Huh? How many of you agree men are different than women, right? And God brings some different people together, but he does it in such a way that we help one another. We, we a help meet a keeper and an easer coming together. And when that happens, it becomes a wonderful thing where people aren't put down, but they're lifted up in a relationship. So there we have a keeper, there we have an easer. We had to talk about that as we get on to talking here now, though, about what it means to be a keeper. And men, as being a keeper, I wanted to outline today four things that a man has to know, okay? Four important things that we have got to get into our heads here today, according to God's word. And the first one is this. Number one, I'm going to say it like this. Hey, man, you are not an accident. Did you hear me, man? Did you hear me? Listen again. Hey, man, you are not an accident. And the reason I'm saying it like that is because that really needs to sink into some in here today. How do we know that? Because we see the results of men who don't know that. Men who haven't discovered that. We see the results in our world and our culture because too many men learned very young that they were simply an accident. And because they thought of themselves an accident, they found themselves aimless. They found themselves not knowing who to follow, what to do. They found themselves needy and empty with a soul inside that's aching and craving for approval, for worth, for value, all because somewhere in their head they got the idea that they were an accident. Maybe it was because that father disappeared on them. Maybe it was because that father could never say what they needed to hear to them. Maybe it was those deep down daddy wounds that go, oh, 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 man, do those things go deep. But, oh, man, listen, I got to tell you, you are not an accident. In fact, just the opposite. And that's what you need to hear today. That's what you need to absorb today. That's what you need to know today. Because that changes so much. That changes so much in your life, but also in the life of those around you. You are not an accident. I've, if you ever get the chance, you might want to go. I'm just using this to illustrate this point right here. But uh, Dennis Rodman, in his Hall of Fame speech, uh, couldn't keep it together. He just continued to weep and cry for most of it. But one of the things he said in his Hall of Fame speech was, my father left me when I was five years old. He has 47 kids in the Philippines. 
He said, and I'm the oldest one. He said he wrote a book about me and made a lot of money, but he never came and said hello to me. And later in the speech, Dennis Rodman went on to say, my greatest regret in life is I haven't been a good father to my three kids. And that story, I believe, resonates with so many in so many ways. We just sang, you're a good, good father, you're a good, good father. And a lot of people are going, I wish I had a good, good father. I wish I had somebody in my life who I could follow after, somebody in my life I could look after, somebody in my life who, who considered me, me significant enough to show up, to be in my life, to speak words of life to me. I wish I had something like that, and, and so many don't. And as a result of that, we have so many men who are so deep down needy, and with the, they, they don't know how to fill up that need inside. And so they wander aimlessly through this life, needing this person to say something nice about them, needing this person to compliment them on a regular basis, needing, needing to get this or to have this, and trying to fill that up. And they just come up short and empty all the time. A father is so desperately needed. A father is so desperately needed in a home, and a family, and a father has the ability to lead. And us, us young boys, when we see a father, we start to follow them naturally, do we not? Whether good or whether bad. To the good places or to the bad places. I remember when I was a little kid, a little kid uh, on my grandparents' farm, uh, they had a big pastures and open fields and, and uh, cows out there everywhere. But out in this uh, big field, um, you would find these giant red ant mounds. I mean, they were giant like that. They would get up very, very big. And, and I remember as a little kid walking through with my dad through, through these fields. And, and uh, I, I'm watching him, watching what he does. And, and my dad will suddenly, he'll walk over and, and he'll put his foot and just kick a big ant hill like that. And just kind of kick it and watch all the ants go everywhere. And he'd go and find another one. He'd kick it like that. And I thought, oh, how cool is that? How cool is that? Dad is so cool. And next thing you know, I found my, my own little ant hill over there. And I go and I, I do just like my dad, but except I didn't take my foot back out. And I can remember looking down and just seeing all those ants start to crawl over me and come up my leg. And sure enough, oh, man, they lit me up. Never forget that. Never forget that. But that's what, that's what we young guys do, right? We need somebody that we can look to, and when we look to them, we want to follow them. We want to do what they do. And some in here today uh, might be going, but, but this is where my dad went, and I'm, I'm destined to go there. I'm doing the same thing in my home and my family, and I want to tell you, you don't have to. It can stop with you. It can stop with you. But how does it stop with you? It's, it, it starts here. you got to know this. you got to know this. Let me read it to you. Psalms 139.16. You, God, saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Oh, God, how precious are your thoughts about me. They cannot be numbered. So, so what's in that? What's in that? Do you see what's in that? Do you see what's in that? A man is actually able to say, wait a second now, I am not an accident. I might have been an accident to you. I might have been an accident to you. But I, it's no accident that I'm here. I, it, it, was, it was God chose for me to be a man on this earth. God chose for me to be here today. God chose for me. He created me, and he thinks about me, and he adores me, and he is a good, good father who is proud of me and wants to be with me. Do you know in Scripture, God says, I will be a father to the fatherless. A father to the fatherless. And so any orphan in here today can say, I'm not really an orphan because I have the greatest father of all who chose me, 
And you see, you see, man, when that, when you know that and you grow in that and that is in your mind and that is in your thought on a regular basis, on a daily basis, I want to encourage you in the, getting into God's word and seeing that and hearing that and growing in that, that changes your makeup so much. You no longer become that, that needy guy. Oh, we've got way too many needy guys. But you no longer become that needy guy. You become the guy who goes and meets needs. You become then that strong tower that people can run to, that you can, you can, you become that keeper. But it starts with you knowing who you really are and that you are not an accident. Second thing I need you to know, man. Hey, man, you have been designed perfectly. Yeah, write that down. I'll explain what we're talking about here. Um, you have been designed perfectly. How have you been designed? There's something um, going around now. Uh, a lot of people talking about it. It's called toxic masculinity. Have you heard of it? And there's the idea in our culture that in order to rid the world of all evils, we need to get rid of toxic masculinity. What is toxic masculinity? Yeah, there is such a thing as toxic masculinity, and toxic masculinity can look like uh, the husband who beats his wife. Certainly toxic. Uh, or the, the toxic masculinity can be the husband who simply abuses his wife through words. Yeah. Uh, toxic masculinity can be a dad who is a bully in the home. Toxic. Uh, toxic masculinity can be toxic even at the office and at work. God has designed men, and like I said before, how many of you have noticed that God made men and women a little bit different, Right? And God has designed man to be bigger in general, stronger in general, uh, to have a lot of uh, testosterone flowing through him, uh, which can be more aggressive by nature, which can uh, be uh, driven in a lot of the ways that God has designed us as men. But the point is that can be used either for good or for evil. There is such a thing as toxic masculinity, but not all masculinity is toxic. And if we throw out masculinity that is not toxic, if we choose to get rid of godly masculinity, then what that does, it ends up creating a world or making a world where good men step out and evil men step in. And women become more vulnerable, more at risk. Children become more vulnerable, more at risk, because there is no godly masculinity. But man, you have to know that you have been designed perfectly, perfectly by God. He didn't mess up when he made you. He made you that way to be a keeper, for that reason, to be a keeper. I was, um, I was in front of Walmart yesterday, walking into Walmart, and uh, as I was walking in, there were these, I noticed these big trucks. They were really, really cool. They were, uh, um, they were uh, big uh, tow trucks, but they weren't the average tow truck. They were these giant tow trucks. Uh, the wheels probably came up to here on me, and it had all these wheels, and I mean, it's just, uh, the thing was huge, and it was towering. It was one of those, uh, there are actually two of, them, two of those tow trucks that carry uh, the 18 wheelers, right? When they break down, some of those. And, uh, and so I was just kind of amazed by that, checking them out and just, they're really, really cool trucks, just looking at, at how awesome and how uh, the power that those things, I mean, they're big trucks and there are trucks that carry big trucks and those are the trucks that carry big trucks. And I thought, how cool these things are and the design that they are, I was just amazed by that. But, but here's the deal, that truck and the way it has been designed can be used to rescue other trucks, can it not? A good purpose. But what if somebody got into one of those trucks and as big as it is, decided to run it through a building? 
What if somebody got in one of those trucks, as big as it is, and when there's, when there's a bunch of cars that are, that are stuck in traffic, just decided to run over and through, it could do it. It could do it. It could cause a whole lot of damage. What's the point? What's the point? Should we get rid of all tow trucks because of that possibility? No. The design is for a good and for a good purpose, but so often Satan wants to come along and take that which is meant for good and use it for evil. And as a result of sin in this world, the enemy has been able to take the, the man and how the man was shaped and how the man was formed and do a whole lot of terrible things with that. What needs to happen, what must happen is that it's reclaimed by God, this form, this man that he has made. And it is used by God for that purpose which is good and not that purpose which is evil. Genesis 2, 7, look what it says right here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In other words, God chose to make men the way he made them. God designed, God formed you, man, for a reason. You've been designed perfectly. But what happens as a result? Psalms 139, 13. He says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. When was the last time you looked in the mirror and said, man, God, you did pretty good. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, too often, too many of us look and we loathe what we see. Because we're not seeing the purpose behind the form in which God made us. We've lost that. Many have lost that. I am... Um, I, I think I told you guys this before, um, but, but uh, several years back, I had to take my, t my truck uh, to get some tires put on it. found the cheapest tires I could. It was down in Griffin. And I drove down to Griffin and found this little tire shop and, and pulled my, my truck up there. And it was one of those gas stations that had closed down and became a tire shop. And, and the guy came out and just right there in front of the store started putting tires on my car. And as he's putting these tires on my car, he started looking at my truck. And if you've ever seen my truck, I've got Falcons on the front and Falcons on the back and Falcon sticker here and all of that. And, hey, how about those Falcons, guys, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I got Falcons all over, all over my truck, and, and uh, so I'm just sitting there on the curb wa watching them put tires on my car, and after a little while, the guy looks over at me and goes, hey, man, do you play for the Falcons? <laughs> Maybe. But man, I tell you, I, I, I love to tell that story because it's so cool to think that, that somebody could actually look at me and think I'm one of those guys. <laughs> but God, listen, listen, uh, just not too long ago, I was, on, I was down on the sideline and standing next to one of those offensive linemen. I ain't one of those guys, man. <laughs> Whew, those are big old guys, you know? But man, I always, I always thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to be a pro athlete? Somebody like that. I mean, God, God, why couldn't you have made that here? <laughs> then I'd be a man, right? Or, or, or how about this? Um, my, my wife told me one time, she goes, I like all those movies with Dwayne the Rock Johnson in them. <laughs> and then she said this, because he's so funny. It took me to, a, a minute to realize funny doesn't mean funny, okay? <laughs> and I always thought, man, if I, could, if I could be like The Rock, then I'd be a man, right? That's a man, man. Then I'd be a man. But, but God didn't make me like a pro athlete. He didn't make me like a pro wrestler or, or a movie star. He made me like this. And he made you like that, man. 
But what does that mean? I want you to know he made you and designed you the way he designed you for a task, for a reason, for a purpose, the right purpose. Because check this out. Check this out. Just this last week, we're sitting down at the table, and my daughter was saying something about somebody she knows and something her father did. And then my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, she still calls me Daddy, how cool is that? She said, Daddy, I know you would never do that. And so even, even though I can't be a hero on the football field, even though I can't be a hero in the movies, I can be a hero to that girl. That's how you've been designed, man, to be a hero. To somebody, somewhere, somehow. You don't even have to be a father to do that. You don't even have to be a husband to do that. Yet, the, other, the other day, um, I was uh, uh, taking my wife and her mother to the uh, doctor's office, mother's doctor's office, and uh, I drove uh, them under the overhang, and my wife got out with her, mo- with her mom, and they went on inside, and I drove the truck back around to park it so I could go inside, and as I got out of my truck, I'm, I'm walking across the parking lot, and I hear somebody say, sir, excuse me, sir, and I look down the way, and, and I happen to see an elderly couple, and he's in the wheelchair, and she barely can walk herself, but she's trying to push him in the wheelchair, and they're, they're not making any progress at all. And they're calling out to me and saying, can you help us? Can you help us? I didn't know them from anybody, but I walked over. And yeah, you know, yeah, a, a, probably a, a, a 10-year-old girl could have pushed him. But, but I pushed him into the doctor's office, helped him get inside. And they sat there and they thanked me and thanked me like I had given them a million bucks. And even though I can't be a hero on the football field, Even though I can't be a hero in the movies, I can be a hero to that couple. And this world, this little world that I'm living in can be better, can be safer because there's a keeper who has answered the call in the moment. God has designed you, man. God has shaped you, man, for a reason and for a purpose. Don't miss it. Don't. Instead, show up. The third thing I need you to know is this, number three. Hey, man, you've got an important job to do. I know I've already talked about this a little bit, but write it down. You've got an important job to do. I talked about toxic masculinity, but something worse going on apart from toxic masculinity is what we, we, let's call it toxic passivity. That's much more prevalent these days. Toxic passivity. It's when a man, even though he's been called to an important job, he fails to show up. He checks out. Again, Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took a man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Again, circle the word keep. Let me pause right there, and let me ask you something. Um, A lot of surveys have been taken um, among women, and the survey is what is or what occupation has the best looking men in it. And number one, always, always, always on the list, number one, anybody wanna guess? Firemen. Firemen, yep. But the question is, why? Is it because of their enormous salaries? Is it because of their cool uniforms? Kind of. Right? But you know what it is? 
women instinctively, instinctively are drawn to a protector, to safe, to somebody who's going to rescue. In other words, women almost more instinctively than we men know our calling better than we know our calling. Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask this. How many of you know Bob Van Dillen? Yeah, okay. Bob Van Dillen. Okay, let me ask this. Um, you probably do know him, but you didn't know you know him because he's gone viral recently. He's the guy that when the flood, that, when the hurricane came through here in Atlanta, uh, he was out there doing his job reporting. And a woman is calling out from her car that's underwater. And he puts aside his job as the news anchor and wades out into the water. And she gets on his back and he walks her back out and rescues her. How many of you know Bob Ben? ben yeah, see what I'm saying? And in the same way, in the, the reason he's gone viral is because there's a protector, there's a keeper, there's a man being a man, doing what he's called to do. But look what happens in Genesis chapter 3, and it goes all the way back, guys. Let's look at it. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, with her, and he ate. Are you kidding me? Adam wasn't, wasn't somewhere not knowing what was not going on. You mean Adam was right there with her as he, he's, he's watching her talk to a snake? <laughs> what you doing, man? What, where's the keeper here? Adam was with her. Wait a second now. You know, you know around my house, if there's ever a snake, you know who's responsible for getting the snake? Uh, years ago, years ago um, our dogs were on the back porch barking, barking, barking at the house. We didn't know what was going on. Walk outside, and there's a big, big black snake crawling up next to the window of our house. It's on our house. And, and Kim, when she sees it, she's on the other side of the glass yelling at me, kill it, kill it, kill it. And, but, but a lot of you know, like I know, that it's one of those, one of those rat snakes, right, or a king snake. Yeah, good snake. And so I didn't want, I didn't want to kill it because it gets rid of mice and everything. And, but she's going, kill it, kill it, kill it. And so instead I reach up and I grab behind the neck right there and I, I grab its tail and it's just kind of wrapping itself all around me like that. And, and, and I'm, I find myself like this with a snake. And now I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> Kim's going, kill it, kill it, kill it. And I didn't want to kill it. And so... I, I decided I'd go and I threw it in my neighbor's yard, you know? And, and, uh, I'm like, he, you're welcome, you know? <laughs> but, but just the fact that, that there was a snake on our, on our house, I had to do something. I'm not going to sit there and do nothing. But Adam does nothing. Adam is with her. And he doesn't fulfill his role. Let me go here, guys. Let me go here, okay? Men, husbands. When the enemy comes to your home and speaks lies to your wife, do you just let him? 
Do you let, do you, do you, when, when he speaks those lies and she starts to believe those lies, you know, you know the ones I'm talking about. You just kind of shrug it off and, oh, well, I'm going to go play my video games. Or do you fight the snake? Do you stand up to the snake? Dads, dads, um, when the enemy comes and starts messing with your kids, you know, when the enemy comes and speaks those lies to your kids and, and starts messing with your kids, do you just sit idly by? Or do you attack that snake? Adam just sat there. Adam didn't fulfill his role as the keeper. You've got an important, 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 important job to do. You know there's something called hikikomori? I guess that's how you say it, hikikomori. Um, it's, it's a Japanese word for National Geographic did, did a piece on this. For, uh, and and they, they highlighted one man in particular, a 37-year-old living with his parents in their basement, hadn't left his house in seven years. He lives off his, lives off his parents and watches porn and plays video games all day, every day. Japan put out in 2013 that they found that there are over 500,000 in Japan doing just that. It's an epidemic. But it's not just a Japan problem. It's becoming a problem here too. Some might say, well, what's the problem with that, you know? What's the problem with that? They're, They're living their best life. They're not hurting anybody, right? I mean, as long as it's not harming anybody, and they would say they're happy, and that what we're supposed to do, just be happy and find where we can be happy? If we could just do that? Some might say, no, there's no problem. Yeah, there is. Oh, there is. Because when they're there doing that, then they're not out in this world doing what they've been called to do. And being the keeper that they, living out their God-given role and task and responsibility. Oh, 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 that men, that men, instead of being so into Call of Duty video game, would answer the Call of Duty in the real life, in the real world. Uh, Don't get me wrong, I'm not down on video games, but I certainly am down on men who never, ever step out to fulfill that role and that task, to be the keeper that God has called them to be. The last one is this. Hey, man, the world needs you to show up. The world needs you to show up. Ezekiel 37.10. God, God, God comes to the prophet Ezekiel, and he says, hey, come here. And he shows him this valley. And it's a valley of just a bunch of bones, bones that have been baking in the sun, and they're all dried out. And he says, hey, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's like, I don't know. I don't know. Only you know that, God. And God says, I want you to speak to these bones. I want you to prophesy to these bones. And and Ezekiel does just that. And and the next thing that happens is uh, these bones begin to, to, to shake and they begin to rattle. And they begin to come together. And they begin to, suddenly they come together and it's a full skeleton of a man. And then suddenly the... The, the man, the flesh, begins to appear on this skeleton of a man. And next thing you know, uh, the, it says the breath is breathed into 
these, the, these men, and they come alive. And do you remember before when, when God formed man, what did he do? He breathed into him, and he came alive. But somewhere along the way, the man went missing. The man became dead. The man became just a bunch of dry bones that, that nobody had any hope for anymore. He's talking about a nation here, a nation that had no hope. But even in a nation like this, that we look around and we see such a lack of men being men, answering the call to their God-given responsibility of being a keeper. And we look across, and it sometimes it might look like a bunch of dry bones, a valley of dry bones with no hope. But, but that's not the end of the story here because he says prophesy to those bones. If those bones hear the word of God, if those bones know what they've been called to do, they can rattle together, flesh and come on. This, these men can come alive. And when these men come alive, let me read it to you. Listen, listen, listen. It says, so I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies, and they all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Oh, man. Can, can you imagine God raising up an army of real men? A great army of real men? who will stand in battle against the evil one, who will be the keeper that he's called to be, who will fulfill that God-given role and purpose, who will know who he is in God. It will be godly masculinity. He becomes a man. He becomes a father. He becomes a grandfather who is there, who has shown up, who is ready to fight and do battle so that others may live. Oh, God, raise up godly men. God, raise up godly men. I want us to bow in prayer. It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never put your faith and trust in him, friend, please hear now today. He is your hope, your only hope. A new life because of Jesus Christ. Call out to him. Maybe today, quietly in your own mind, say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I'm asking you to come in my life and forgive me my sin and be my God, my Savior, my friend forever and ever. Save me. And friend, you can know you have eternal life when you pray that and you mean it. And even more than that, we come and we say, Father, please, Raise us up to do your will and your purpose. We need you. We need you. Help us to be the men that you would have us to be. I'm going to ask us all to stand. What is communion? Communion is identifying with Jesus Christ through his death and his burial and his resurrection. And even here today, for a man to say, I want to be like Christ. I want to be that strong tower in this world in which I live. And so as I take this today, I want it to be a commitment of that communion with you, Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, when Jesus took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And then he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that has been spilled for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the calling you brought us to. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Pastor Bo, thanks so much for an awesome message.